Hi, welcome to tonight's session of Introduction to Apologetics. Tonight we are going to start section six, and the exciting thing about that is once we're done with tonight, we are more than halfway done with the entire course of Introduction to Apologetics. Tonight's course is entitled Intelligent Design, Intelligent Design. And the thing about it is, remember last week we did evolution, naturalism, and creation. And it was more of kind of a defensive position, uh, more of kind of a negative uh, uh, position that we were taking, kind of blowing holes in evolution. Well, tonight it's going to be the very opposite in that we are going to put a positive uh, defense for the biblical creator, for a designer, so to speak. So Intelligent Design is the name of tonight's course. And again, we're going to try to add bullets into your evangelistic gun that you can use primarily to towards the uh, the atheist and uh, non-believer. So, session goal to understand the vast complexity of our universe, solar system, and life systems in order to make a powerful defense for the biblical creator. So we're going to try to understand how we can how we can extract from science, the universe, uh, the solar system, the DNA, this idea of a biblical creator. And is this a biblical position to take? Well, Let's look at our areas of study first, and then we're going to answer that question. First, we're going to look at competing theories. Naturalism, evolution, creationism, and kind of understand how intelligent design fits into that. We're going to look at the limits of science, because as you know, science has become very um, tyrannical in America, in that if the scientific community says so, everybody seems to have to agree. And so we're going to look at what are some of the limits of science that we know for sure. Uh, we're going to answer the question, what is intelligent design, and look at two, three theories within the intelligent design community. Uh, we're going to look at intelligent design versus chance, because really that's what evolution is. Uh, that's what naturalism is, is, is a, uh, a theory built completely on this idea of random chance or random mutations. So we're going to look at what is intelligent design versus chance. We're going to look at the universe. We're going to look at the biosphere, that is our solar system. We're going to look at the origin of life. We're going to look at the genetic code and see if, in fact, the evidence is pointing towards an intelligent designer or chance. And finally, we're going to uh, have some questions for the skeptics. Again, here we're not answering questions. We're going to give you questions that you can put out there that are very legitimate questions that you can ask a skeptic or a um, or an atheist. So our foundational scripture, our foundational scripture is found in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 21. And let me read that for you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what they what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. A couple of very important points here. Number one is that everybody innately has a knowledge of God. But what does it say here? is that they suppress the truth. So innately, we all have this knowledge and desire to know God, but what some do is that they suppress the truth. Another important part of this verse, and it's what really built uh, uh, the, the scientific process and why it emerged in Western civilization, is because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So it says, well, we can see the attributes of God, the Bible says. How do we see the attributes of God? Being understood by the things that are made. So we should be able to look at God's creation and extract from that God's invisible attributes. And it was that pursuit that really led to the scientific process here in Western civilization. Why did science emerge in Western civilization and not in, you know, Asian civilization, uh, Muslim civilization, uh, uh, you know, in other places? And this is the primary reason why. Because men of God decided to pursue the knowledge of God through nature. 
So let's start with our first question that we want to answer, which we've looked at before, but we want to kind of reiterate here. Why did God, who needs nothing, make the universe, stars, dinosaurs, humans, etc.? Why did God make all this? Why did he make all the stars? Why did he make black holes? Why did he make uh, an earth, a moon? Why, why did God do this? He needs nothing. Why did he do this? And we've answered this question before. And the, the only biblical answer is for his glory. Put another way, to display for all the heavens to see his perfect and magnificent attributes. So he did it so that we would recognize us and all the heavens, his incredible attributes. And here's a scripture verse, Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. The heavens declare the glory of God. So how do we, how do we understand the glory of God? It says through the heavens. And I truly believe that the closer we get to this knowledge of the heavens, the deeper our worship will be. Because our ability to worship is, is founded on this idea that God is awesome, that God is amazing, that God is incredible, that God is love, but that he's also powerful and strong and wise. And so it could ultimately deepen our worship. So from a historical perspective, men of science, historically, uh, always recognized that there was special revelation, that's the Bible, they would refer to it as special revelation, but there was something else called general revelation, and that was nature. They, these scientists, again in the you know, 15th, 16th century, they really looked at the record of nature as the record of God's attributes. So um, they took a profound pursuit of the knowledge of God through this book of nature. Here's another question that we'd like to answer. How does a God of justice allow people who have never heard the gospel to go to hell? How does a God, people who've never heard the gospel, how is it just that they would go to hell if they've never had a chance to repent? Okay. How do we answer that question? And the answer is found in the scripture we just looked at, Romans uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 18 through 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. That is to say, any person anywhere in the world, from any culture, should be able to look at the heavens, to look at nature and say, there is an awesome God creator. Okay? Now there's one other verse that, will, that also... Um, uh, applies here. But ideally, what we're understanding is that nature is God's great evangelist. It's nature that reveals God's glory to people who've never heard the gospel. So the Bible says that they are without excuse. Nature is God's grand, grand evangelist. But also in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 through 15, it states, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So, we have the ability to look at nature and say there's an awesome God, and then our conscience bears witness to this and convicts us of sin and leads us to a place of repentance. So God has established everything within us and within nature to lead us to a saving knowledge of Him. Okay? We don't have to have a preacher, although I believe that if you have a true desire to know Jesus and God, a preacher will show up. And we've, we've heard countless and countless and endless examples of people who desire to know God, and simultaneously a preacher showed up to preach the gospel, my life being uh, one of those examples. So, God reveals himself in nature, and God reveals himself in our hearts and our conscience. So that man is without excuse. This also implies that the record of nature has to be accurate. That is to say, if anyone says to you, well, God did this in order to, to show us something differently, okay? Be very weary of anyone who says the book of nature is somehow not accurate and not uh, descriptive of what actually happened in history. Okay, the book of nature, in order, in order for God to send someone to hell, the book of nature must be accurate. Our, we 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 have to be able to have a knowledge, a true knowledge of nature. 
of our, the history of this world, the history of the universe, what we observe through telescopes, what we observe through the through the human eye, through the um, through um, you know telescopes or what have you. But so it's got to be an accurate record because otherwise God would not be just. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here coming up. So how does the God? How does the universe? help us better understand the biblical creator how does this universe help us understand and i created this list this is not there's no right or wrong answer to this you can have your own list but i'm going to just give you a few examples of how i see god in the works of nature and in the universe the galaxies well how do, what does that say about god well to me it speaks of the power of god okay his incredible size and power and strength the water cycles, that speaks to me of God's care. You know, if you look at the water cycle we have here on earth, it's very fine-tuned. It's very specific to get clean water to us. You know, the way that, that gravity pulls up the water, you know, uh, uh, forms it in clouds, moves it over land, and then waters our uh, crops is a very, very fine-tuned and carefully thought-out process. So the water cycle speaks to me of God's care. Vegetation speaks to me of God's provision. You know, how, could, how does the evolution answer the question why we have fruit trees? You know, why we have beautiful flowers? So to me, that speaks of God's provision, getting the earth ready for us to inhabit. DNA, that speaks to me of God's wisdom. We're going to look at the DNA molecule. We're going to see the a massive amount of information in the, you know, human genome and, and, uh, and, and in DNA in general. The amount of information that's stored there speaks to me of God's incredible wisdom molecules this speaks to me of god's provision i'm sorry precision you know if you look at the size of a molecule and the fact that it operates like a modern city this is astonishing that it is so precise and there's nothing man-made that could compare in any way shape or form uh, uh photosynthesis uh, that speaks to me of God's preparation. You know, if you look at the creation account and you look at the history of life on earth, you see that the trees emerge first, and that was to oxygenate the air, obviously. But photosynthesis is also a precise um, a chemical reaction that speaks of God's wisdom, uh, precision as well. Uh, gravity, that speaks to me of God's order. You know, how he used the right amount of gravity to uh, create an environment for us that was very habitable. And we'll look at that a little bit closer. How precise is gravity? So it speaks to me of God's order and how he used that to bring order to the universe and the planets. And finally, what the Bible teaches us is, what does the cross say about Jesus, about God? And, and Romans 5.8 speaks very clearly of this. God demonstrated his love uh, towards us in that while we were all sinners, Christ died for us. How do we know God loves us? The Bible says right here very clearly is because Christ died for us. Now, these are all attributes of God, uh, God's care, God's power, God's provision, God's wisdom, and uh, we can extract it from the universe, from the world. Now, God's love, we can look at it other ways too. Uh, when, when an atheist would ask me, how do you know God loves you? Uh, sometimes I'll respond not only with using the, uh, the evidence of the cross, but the fact that he's provided everything on this earth for us. You know, um, and we'll get more of what I'm about to say in the evil and suffering. But think about this. When, um, when there's a tragedy, like there was this week where there was a, a shooting uh, in a church, atheists are quick to say, well, how does God exist? There is a tragedy. Uh, there's evil in the world. But while that may be true, we're going to struggle sometimes to uh, explain evil and suffering in the biblical worldview. They've got a much bigger task. Because they've got to explain why there is goodness in the world. You know, why everything is so perfect and so right for human beings to live a fruitful life. So while these are exceptions, you know, these cases of tragedy, they've got to explain all the other incidents, instances where, in fact, there is good going on in the world. And people are eating and people are healthy and babies are born healthy. And, you know, how do they explain that? Uh, based on a you know chaotic, undirected uh, process. So um, the cross demonstrates God's love for us. So let's look at some competing theories, the competing theories we're going to talk about tonight. First, let's start with creation. The idea, the universe, all life, matter, energy, and time is the product of a purposeful creative act by a creator who exists outside the creation as explained by the Bible. So the 
Theory of creation is simply that, that everything we see is the purposeful creation of a creator God. Okay? That means everything, whether we're talking about the trees. Now, many of us will take it to where God created it and then let the process go through of, uh, you know, of eating, of uh, trees being fertilized, of trees growing through the natural process. But the point is, is that, that you know, the theory of creation says that all this is a product of a purpose, a purposeful creative act. Intelligent design, the theory that features in the universe, solar system living organisms, are best explained by an intelligent agent or an intelligent cause. Okay? So what, what, what it is, it's a theory. Okay? It's a theory. Now many will say, well, um, uh, intelligent design is in science. It is not science, any more than, than the theory of evolution is science. It's not. It's a theory to explain the evidence, what we know, the data the information that we see. So it is a theory to explain the features of the universe, the solar system, and, uh, and life systems. Naturalism, we already spoke of this, and we said it's a philosophical commitment to a universe governed exclusively by natural causes. A universe of matter and energy with no underlying purpose, direction, or design. Now, of course, you know, big problem with naturalism, and we saw quite a few of them, is that they already presuppose the laws of nature, okay, the laws of physics, for example. And um, where did those come from? You know, where did those come from? Because every bit of their theory it already has those in, in effect. So that's naturalism. And finally, we looked at last week the theory of evolution, the theory that claims that all species emerge from a common ancestor through the process of random mutations and natural selection. So intelligent design is very different from evolution because evolution only tries to explain the, uh, the, the, the process of speciation, okay? the species here on earth, okay? how we emerge from a, a common ancestor and how that process evolved. Okay? Now naturalism is broader because it starts from the creation of the universe to now, and in the same way, the theory of intelligent design is broad. Okay? There's intelligent design theorists that are looking at the, the Big Bang, the, the initial conditions of the universe, the position within our solar system, and they're also looking at life systems as Darwinian evolution does. And they're just extracting from that to either support or reject the theory of intelligent design. So. That is intelligent design versus naturalism. So what is the scientific process? We answered this question last week. Let's look at it again. Replicating or observing an event in a controlled environment to verify or reject a hypothesis. That is a scientific process. It is based on observable cause and effect relationships. Okay. So we're going to look at some of the limits of science. So this is Matilda here in this picture, and she's baking a cake. She's baking a cake. What could science tell us about Matilda and her cake? A nutritionist can tell us how many calories it has. That's what a nutritionist does. A biochemist can tell us about the structure of the proteins and the fats. A chemist can tell us about the bonding of the elements within the cake. But only Matilda can give us the reason and the meaning for her cake. The science can't give us the answer to reasons and meaning. Science can only answer the how questions, how molecules bind, how gravity works, but only Matilda can tell us the why. Science cannot tell us why chemicals bind, why uh, gravity functions the way it does. So it is limited, and let's look at a few more. Over the past 500 years, man has discovered many of the laws of physics in biology. It has led many to think this eliminates the need for a creator or a designer. So let me start by way of analogy. What has happened over the last 300, 500, 100 years as we, as scientific information has increased? Because this is what has happened. And let me do it by way of analogy. Supposing you found a, a, a small civilization in the Amazon jungle that has never been exposed to technology, ever. They don't have running water, they don't have phones, electricity, none of that. And you pull up there and you leave them a Ford Mustang, brand new Ford Mustang, okay? It's very likely that they're gonna look at this Ford Mustang and say, oh, the gods brought the Ford Mustang, oh, 
uh, uh, it doesn't turn on today, so the gods must be angry with us. Um, and they'll attach many, many myths to the Ford Mustang. Okay? But over time, they begin to realize, wait a minute, actually, if you turn the key this way, it does turn on. It's not the gods that turns it on. And they learn about the laws of combustion, how the motors work. So it's not the gods that are running the motor. And they learn about the laws of, uh, of motion. So they understand how the wheels turn and how this thing moves. And it will diminish their, uh, their mythological understanding or metaphysical understanding of this car. That's a true statement. What is a, what is a jump though, uh, a big leap, is to say that the car itself does not have a designer. And that's where we are today in science. That while it has uh, dispelled many myths that our civilization, even Western civilization, carried for many centuries, it's a big leap to say that, in fact, there is no designer. Okay, so think of the Ford Mustang and think of them getting to the point where they understand how the Ford Mustang works, but now it's a whole another leap, okay, to say it was not designed. So take an eye, for example. You know, we've learned how the molecules work, we learn how the DNA works, we know how they form uh, proteins and then ultimately assemble an eye. Okay, so we've learned that. But is that enough to say an eye is not the product of design, that it uh, that, that all these laws can explain an eye coming together. And so that's the big leap that we're seeing in science today when you move from the scientific evidence to atheism and claim that it explains everything we know. So some of the limits of science. Let's talk about some of the limits of science. Science cannot give us any understanding of purpose. What is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of of um, you know friendship what is the purpose of marriage it cannot answer the purpose question what is the purpose of the universe what is the purpose of humanity uh, what are the purpose of extinctions on the earth they cannot answer the purpose question okay it is blank slate for them consciousness is another one that they struggle and there are many scientists coming out and saying that natural causes could never account for consciousness and uh, remember that that was this idea that we are aware of awareness, uh, the ability to think about our past, reflect on the past, uh, uh, plan the future, understand that I'm a human being and that I have a plan or purpose. They can't explain that because they're not natural forces working. Right? They can remember scientific process can only study natural causes, and we know consciousness rises above that. Beauty. Uh, uh, science could not tell us anything whether something is beautiful or whether something is not. You know, we don't, when we look at a sunset and say this is beautiful and look at a junkyard and say this is ugly, it's not science that comes to us and say, look, we did a study, we did an experiment, and in fact, you know, this is beautiful and this is not. It can't answer the question of aesthetics. Um, love, uh, it cannot answer, cannot test whether I love someone, whether I don't. Why is there love? Why do I love someone? Again, this is beyond the realm of science. Bravery and compassion. This you know, bravery is very contradictory to the theory of evolution. And why is that? Because under the theory of evolution, the primary drive is for survival. It's for me to survive. But when I do something brave and put my life on the line, or even something compassionate which costs me something, that is in conflict with this idea that I'm just here to survive, that that is the primary drive in all the species. So they can't answer that question, why are people brave? Why are people compassionate? Uh, I can't answer the moral question. You know, what is right and what is wrong? You know, is rape right or is rape wrong? We don't go to science for the answer to those questions, even we, though we know that those are legitimate questions that do have answers. Meaning, I can't, I can't answer the question of meaning, purpose, understanding, and finally, anything that is metaphysical or supernatural cannot be answered by science. Remember, it only tests natural causes. And we can, we can add many things to this list, but that is... Uh, uh, a list that we would uh, want to keep in mind while we are speaking with people because as I said science has become very tyrannical and uh, it's nice sometimes to be able to remind these people who only believe in science that in fact science does has limits so science and the Bible science in the Bible now 
remember the Bible is not a scientific book. It's not a scientific book. Um, there are, though, some things that could be verified scientifically, uh, particularly using the historical process. You know, did Babylon exist? Did Tyre exist? Uh, uh, was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? And, of course, when we get to the Bible class on authenticity of the Bible, we're going to look at some of those. But there are other claims in the Bible. And there's been some conflict here over the centuries with science and with uh, the Bible and its cl scientific claims. Uh, so let's look at a couple. And, and I kind of made a note here. Bad science does not equal good interpretation. So if we have bad science and we have good interpretation, these will be in conflict. And here's an example, the steady state theory, which we talked about last week. The steady state theory said that the universe was eternal, that matter is static, and that nothing is, um, uh, uh, is in fact uh, uh, running out. So it's always been here and it will always be here. Uh, and then the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. So these were in conflict for many, uh, many, many years, decades, where the, you know, the scientific community was saying the universe is eternal, and we are saying, no, there was a beginning. So bad science is not equal good interpretation. Good science does not equal bad interpretation. And we've had our share of that. Not a lot, like they would claim, the atheists would claim, but we have a few examples where there was bad interpretation. Uh, and let's look at one. The heliocentric um, uh, solar system was obviously good science, that the sun is in the center of the solar system. I don't know any Christians who think otherwise. Yet, uh, there were many Christians for a lot of time that believed that the earth was the center of the, um, of the solar system. And there's a reason why they believe that, and it could be found in Joshua, where God said that I will stop the sun, and the Bible says God stopped the sun from rising, or I'm sorry, from setting. So he stops the sun. Now many interpret that to believe that the sun was revolving around the earth. And a quick review of that, a quick read of that would imply, sure enough, that in fact the, earth, the sun is the one that had to stop and that it did not uh, set because, in fact, it wasn't moving anymore. And so that was bad interpretation. It was seemed kind of rational at the time that we would take that interpretation, and a lot of good theologians back then actually took that interpretation. Now, we've had to relook at that, haven't we? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking another look at Scripture and making it fit. Uh, in fact, uh, it was Newton who we just uh, uh, saw a picture of who said, that it's, it's up to theologians, once we have so, you know, solid information on one side, to relook at the scripture and see, is there something going on here that we missed? Now, let's answer that question on how we reinterpreted that. And this is an interpretation that's going to apply in other scripture verses, okay? And that is, and, and not as it relates to science, but in this particular case and in one other, which we'll look at in just a little bit, um, is the way we've actually looked at that is said that it actually did stop relative to Joshua and someone on earth. Okay, So the perspective, and this matters in lots of scripture, again, not, uh, there's very few as it impose, applies, I, don't, I can only think of one other as it implies these scientific things, but when you're reading the Bible, you always take the position of the person, uh, uh, the subject of that, of that scripture verse. So in this particular case, it was Joshua and his army. And in fact, relative to where Joshua was standing, that sun did stop. Okay, So we've actually gone back in there and taken a different look and a different interpretation of this in order to make sense. Because we know that, in fact, the sun is the center of our solar system. That is irrefutable. And so we've had to go back. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, in, uh, if you remember the first session... Uh, 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 Neil deGrasse was critical of Christians because we've had to do that. And there's only one or two verses that we actually did that in, while science does that all the time. You know, like I said, there's probably 25 models right now for um, the, uh, a multiverse or an explanation of a, of a pre-universe, uh, uh, what was going on before the universe existed. And so... If any of them are right, it's only going to be one because they're in great conflict. So nothing wrong with reinterpreting and re-looking at Scripture verses to get better meaning from them. Okay? 
Finally, good science equals good interpretation. And a good example is Big Bang cosmology, which the primary tenet, and we'll look at this in a few minutes, is that the universe had a beginning in time. The universe actually began, and, uh, and the Bible teaches, of course, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And Big Bang cosmology is accepted by, by astronomers and physicists now universally. You know, it's universally accepted. And it's been tested and tested and tested, and all the data continues to support this idea that the universe had a beginning in time. So what does intelligent, how does intelligent design fit into our biblical worldview and our biblical understanding of science? And I kind of, I, I did a small chart here. You know, theologians teach creationism, but theologians are exactly what it implies, that they are theologians. That's what they do is they teach Bible. The scientific community, on the other hand, is focused on making everything fit into an evolutionary naturalistic paradigm. So where does intelligent design fit in here? Because again, our experts are in the Bible and they have expertise in natural causes. And this is where intelligent design really fits in. It kind of bridges that gap between theologians and, and the scientific community because many of them are Christians, although not all of them, Many of them believe in the Bible and the creator of the Bible. So um, it kind of helps us bridge that gap between evolution and naturalism and theology and the Bible. Now, many have been critical of the intelligent design movement. And the primary reason is because they don't generally point to the biblical creator or Jesus Christ. Okay. Their theory basically states that these are the product of design. So someone must have been designer. If you have design, you must have a designer. So they stop short of, 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 of you know, preaching the gospel or referring to Christ or even the Bible. So many Christians have been critical of the movement simply because of that. Okay? And whether it's a legitimate uh, uh, criticism or not doesn't matter to me because it is still very, very useful information to the Christian, and here's how. And I, I mentioned this before, when you're talking to an atheist, the distance between a, the atheist and a creator is the widest gap. Okay, that, that, that The atheist believes that there's no creator, and getting him all the way to this point where he can admit, okay, there is a God, that's the widest gap. And most people believe, most evangelists believe, that once you've got them there, that getting them from God to the God of the Bible is a much shorter distance. So the way it can help the evangelist, intelligent design and the information coming from it, is again, to help bridge that gap between an atheist and God. There must be a creator, a designer, whatever you want to call them. And then, once we get them there, then the gap between a deist, when he just believes in God, and the Christian is a much smaller distance. Now, how can it help the Christian? How can it help the Christian? Well, I'm one who strongly believes that intelligent design can strengthen our faith as it helps to show us um, you know, the attributes of God that we see in the universe. And finally, as I mentioned, it can also enhance our worship as we learn more about our Creator and our God. So that's how a kind of intelligent design fits into evangelism. So what is intelligent design? What is intelligent design? Um, and let me start with a quote from Charles Darwin. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed that could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So let's, let's refresh now. Darwin's, Darwin's theory basically says this, that there's a slight modification, and now we know that would have been in the DNA, okay, um, a mutation. That mutation would benefit the species. That species would then have to kind of isolate himself from the others, or they would all have to die off uh, uh, from environmental pressures, because if it doesn't, then that mutation is going to dissipate through multiple breedings. 
So you got a positive mutation. The environment is such that all these others die off and that one survives, hopefully with a mate, okay? And then that modification goes on and then it creates another beneficial modification. And through this process, and those species die off and then that modification survives. And then again, another slight modification in the DNA. Uh, uh, and so let's just assume a, you know, a, a finger's growing. One grows a finger, the other ones don't have a finger. The environment is such where they can't eat because they need a finger to eat and they die off. And then next thing you know, that generation goes on and then before you know it, another one springs another finger. The environment is such that they can't grab any more fruit and those all die off, but the two, the two finger one lives on and then they were able then to pass it on to their offspring and so it's slight slight modification. Of course, a finger is not a slight modification. That is a huge modification that encompasses a lot of DNA. So it's really kind of like a stub and then that stub continues to grow into a finger or several stubs that grow to fingers. So that's his theory in essence. Michael Behe uh, wrote Darwin's Black Box, which is the big, you know, one of the first big uh, uh, breakthroughs in intelligent design. And he posits the idea that a system of information, specified complexity, and purpose must be the product of an intelligent agent. That intelligent causes do things unintelligent causes cannot. So let's look at that again. Information. Okay, you have a system that contains information. And that system has specified complexity. Okay, we're going to understand what that is here in a minute. Okay, And if that thing has purpose then it has to be the product of an intelligent agent. So let's look at that. Let's look at an eye. An eye has information. The massive amount of, of DNA required to create a human eye in the millions and millions of strands or, or DNA sequences necessary. Okay? Then you have the amino acids that that creates, again, in the millions. And then also those combine to form proteins that ultimately uh, function as your lens, as your uh, um, uh, um, nervous system, you know, everything that uh, the retina, you know, everything that the eye has in order to function, okay? So there's information there. There's what's called specified complexity, and that is that that information has to be very specialized to that task. So in the case of the eye, if you get a few of those sequences wrong, you do not have... Um, you don't have eyesight anymore. So it's got to be right, and that's what specialized complexity is, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then it has purpose, and I was designed to see. When you have these things, and we have lots of it in nature, that clearly is the product of an intelligent agent. So that's Michael Behe's uh, first move to intelligent design. Now, there's one other, which is just a little bit different, and that's William Densky, who wrote the design inference, I think, in 94. And in this book, he distinguishes between three competing explanations for biological systems. He says regularity, chance, and design. We see that everywhere. It's either regularity, chance, or design. Okay? Dembski demonstrated that if the thing being examined cannot be explained by regularity, and if it is too statistically unlikely to be explained by chance and contains an independent, uh, independently given pattern, then it may be attributed to design. Dembski claims that his concept is used in detecting, in detecting design in different fields, including forensic science, archaeology, uh, insurance fraud investigation, um, cryptograph, and the SETI investigation. So let's look at that. He says, if it's, let's look at a crime scene investigation. Okay. He's saying if it's, let's say you walk up to a crime scene investigation and the door has been slammed open, right? The, the, the door frames all smashed and the door's been, you know, pushed in, kicked in, big hole in the middle. So is it regularity? Is it chance or is it design? Well, let's look at regularity. If you walk up to that crime scene, you haven't gone inside yet and you see this door smashed open, but it turns out that a storm had, had gone through that neighborhood, a tornado, the day before. And you look around and you see all the other doors on all the neighborhoods are also smashed in. That's regularity, right? It's something that happens on regularly when a, a tornado comes through. So if it's regularity, then there's no intelligent design. 
If it's statistically unlikely, then that cannot be intelligent design. So what is statistically unlikely? So you walk up to the crime scene, the door smashed in. Someone could say, hey, wait a minute, this neighborhood has a lot of elk, right? These big, you know, deer-like animals, and it's possible that an elk slammed that door down. Well, it is possible, but it's improbable, okay? Statistically improbable. So again, you're walking up to this crime scene, you've got two choices in front of you. Is it regularity? Well, everybody else's door is broken in, so then it's not designed. Is it statistically improbable, okay? Uh, or is it statistically probable? You look at the door, someone could say, wait a minute, it could have been an elk. That has happened before, 100 years ago, an elk broke through a door. But you say that's statistically improbable. So now your only other choice is someone purposefully knocked that door down. Okay? And we go through these analyses in our heads all the time, every day, all of us, right? If I, uh, if we were playing Scrabble last night and um, I walk into the kitchen the next morning and there's a Scrabble board and all, this, all the letters are all scrabbled everywhere, I don't make anything of it, right? I think, well, statistically, that sh could be like that. Regularity, yes, of course. You know, we, we, we moved everything around before we went upstairs to go to bed, okay? On the other hand, if I walk in, and I see letters scrabbled uh, that say, remember to buy milk. Remember to buy milk. Well, I can say regularity, no, that doesn't, regularly those letters don't fall like that. Uh, statistically improbable, yes. Uh, statistically improbable, so it can't be chance. And therefore, it's got to be the product of design, probably my wife telling me to pick up milk. Okay, so... Again, specificity, complexity, and you have design. Let's look at one quick example. A mountainside looks complex, right? It's got edges, they're sharp, and everything else. On the other hand, Mount Rushmore, that's specificity, right? Because we don't think statistically or by any kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of randomness that the heads of the president can be carved out of a rock. So we look at that and we say, this is clearly the product of design, okay? Now, let's look at Michael Behe because now he comes up with a theory called irreducible complexity to challenge uh, uh, Darwin's initial uh, claim. Remember, he said that if it can be proven that this cannot happen by successive small modifications, then my theory breaks down. So he comes up with a series that's called irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity, a single system which is composed of several interacting parts and, and where the removal of any one part causes a system to cease from functioning. So he's saying an irreducible complex system is one where there are many parts in order for it to function properly. And if you remove one, then it no longer functions. In essence, what he's saying is that these systems would have had to evolve simultaneously to get that advantage and to get uh, uh, natural selection to work on it. Because remember, for natural selection to work, it has to be an advantage. Okay? So he's saying that's fine, but if you need multiple things to, uh, to uh, evolve simultaneously to have a functioning system, then natural selection could not work on that. Okay? Because you, it is unlikely that all these things would happen, mutate simultaneously. So, natural selection, an irreducible complex system cannot be produced uh, directly by numerous successive flight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor to an irreducible complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. Since natural selection can only choose systems that are already working, then if a biological system cannot be produced gradually, it would have to arise as an in integrated unit in one fell sweep for natural selection to have anything to act on. That is the part that is the part has to be fully functioning to give the species an advantage and thus have a, a natural selection to work on it. Now, he uses the example of the mousetrap, okay, a very simple example, okay. A mousetrap uh, mouse has a hammer, it has a spring, 
it has a catch, it has a platform, and it has a holding bar. Okay? If you remove any one of those, you no longer have a functioning mousetrap. So see how the system needs multiple parts for it to have an advantage, for it to actually function. Okay? And then he moves from there to the example of the eye, which has many, many, many parts, and um, you know the lens, the cornea, the iris, um, and so forth. And if you remove one of those, you generally don't have vision. You surely don't have clean vision. And in some, if you obviously remove them, you have no vision. So all of them would have had to evolve simultaneously. Okay? Now, he uses this example quite uh, often. And the scientific community has come back with a response. And they have said that they are uh, eyes uh, uh, that give vision that are not nearly as complex as this one, okay, the human eye. But the fact remains that they're still vastly complex and they still require multiple parts. So while they have refuted this, their refutation uh, is not on solid ground or very legitimate because, once again, they give examples that are very clearly, while not as uh, uh, advanced as the human eye, they are clearly still require multiple parts and they are very complex and very refined and require many mutations. So that is irreducible complexity, irreducible complexity. So intelligent design and chance, intelligent design. Let's first look at the human eye. The complexity of the eye surpasses human comprehension. For example, the retina is a very thin and complex tissue lining the back of the eye. It contains 7 million cone cells for color assessment, 125 million rod cells for adaptation to the dark, and 1.2 million nerve cells that collect billions of bits of information. For images to be registered in the brain, it takes an incredibly complex arrangement of photochemical receptors, nerve cells, electrical signals too, and within the brain muscles, te uh, uh, teardrops, skeletal structures, not to mention the absurdly complicated arrangement of molecules which make up the eye. And that is a quote, a quote from Jeffrey Simmons, who's a doctor who wrote what Darwin didn't know. So, so imagine this, 1.2 million uh, 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 receptors to collect information, okay? Now, try to imagine that you hire the best, best electricians on the earth, and you tell them, you bring them out to a football field and say, I want you to string together 1.2 million lights, and I want them consistently and in perfect order. They wouldn't even come close to what has happened in our eye and what God created when he put 1.2 million uh, uh, cells together perfectly symmetric to, um, to process the light that comes into our eye. So it's unexplainable and to think that these top electricians couldn't do it as precise as we see it in the eye, but chance can, is bordering on absurdity. So let's watch a film now. This is a lustrous film called um, Unlocking the Mystery of Life. I, it, this film is an incredible witnessing tool. So if you have someone who's thinking about atheism, who's moving away from the gospel or an actual atheist, this, I have purchased these, so many of these and given them away because anybody who looks at this will be astounded by what they see as they begin to unravel the mystery of life. So uh, I highly urge you to get a copy and use it for your witnessing, particularly with atheists. Natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, though slow steps.
it's really interesting to notice that the more we know about life and the more we know about biology, the more problems Darwinism has and the more design becomes apparent. Since 1988, Dr. Michael B. has investigated complex biological systems that seem to defy explanation by natural selection. For the longest time, I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. And through college and graduate school, I was in an atmosphere which just assumed that Darwinian evolution explained biology. And again, I didn't have any reason to doubt it. It wasn't until about no, oh, 10 years or more ago that I read a book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a, a geneticist by the na name of Michael Denton, an Australian. And he put forward a lot of scientific arguments against Darwinian theory that I had never heard before. And, and the arguments uh, seemed pretty convincing. And at that point, I, I started to get a bit angry because I, I thought I was being led down the primrose path. Here were a number of very good arguments and I had gone through a, a doctoral program in biochemistry, became a faculty member, and uh, I had never even heard of these things. And so from that point on, I became very interested in, in the question of evolution and, and uh, since have decided the Darwinian uh, processes are not uh, the whole explanation for life. Michael Behe's skepticism derived in large measure from what modern biology has revealed about life's most fundamental unit, the cell. In the 19th century when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimbleful of cultured liquid can contain more than four billion single-cell bacteria, each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines the complexity of which Charles Darwin could never have imagined. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines, literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in my view. In speaking on the topic of scientific naturalism and evolution... During the early 1990s, at a series of academic conferences, Behe first shared his doubts about the ability of natural selection to construct complex molecular machines. One machine particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor.
In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. So as you can see, that video demonstrates that it is, there's so many systems in biology that have multiple parts which would require the evolution of those parts simultaneously, something evolution could not explain. So can chance create something? Can chance create something? Because that is always going to be their fallback position. Now they're going to tell you that it's not. They're going to say natural selection is not chance. We, we know that that's not chance. That's not what we're claiming is chance. What we're claiming is chance is the mutations, is the DNA sequences, that that has to happen by chance. So can chance create anything? And let me read from the PowerPoint and then I'll give you a better explanation. The problem with all the possible naturalistic explanations is that they all rely heavily on chance. Chance does not create, nor does it have any explanatory power. And here's an example. If I have a die in my hand and I roll that dice and the number six comes up and I say, well, it came up by chance. The thing about it is that chance did not make that six happen. What made that six happen is the force that I applied and the angle at which it hit the table and the way it rolled, um, you know, the fabric of the table, the resistance, that's what landed the six. All chance says is, I don't know how it happened, but it falls within a, st a statistical probability. Okay, it is probable uh, statistically that a six would have rolled, but it doesn't explain why the six happened. Okay, here's a quote from Stephen Meyer, Signature in the Cell, one of the best books that you're going to read on uh, microbiology and intelligent design. Chance can only explain an event when it falls within an expect expected statistical distribution. If I win the lottery once or even twice in my lifetime, that would fall within the expected region. If I win it every week for 10 years, that would require a new explanation. Okay. So again, if I roll a six one time, that's fine. If I roll it five times, people are going to start asking questions. If I roll it a hundred times, then that of course would not um, fall within that realm and people would start realizing that someone has messed with these dice. Okay, So again, chance can only be used when it falls within a statistical probability or statistical distribution as uh, Myers would say. So Einstein's Big Bang. Let's look at the designer of the universe and then we're going to get back to that, what we were just talking about, and we're going to look at it in, in terms of the um, the um, 
the emergence of life? How did life begin here on Earth? Does it fall within that range? And then we are going to look at also the cell and all the complexity within the cell, whether it falls in that range. But let's jump now to the universe. Does the universe show intelligence uh, and a creative act rather than just some chaotic event? Einstein's Big Bang, the biblical Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang, the primary tenets of the Big Bang is that the universe began from nothing. There was nothing and then the universe began and that it has been expanding ever since. Okay, So is that what the Bible teaches? And because there's been a lot of Christians who have been opposed to the Big Bang cosmology, but they really don't understand it. They think that somehow it's related to evolution and it's godless and what have you. But it doesn't take any of those positions. Basically, again, the primary tenets are there was nothing, the universe blew into existence, and it's been expanding ever since. What does the Bible tell us? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are invisible. And again, the Big Bang states very clearly by Einstein's um, calculations and theory that there was nothing, no wind, no air, no time, nor space, none of it. And within a second, boom, all the energy and all the matter, time itself, was created instantly and has been expanding ever since. What does Psalm 104 2 say? Uh, he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, referring to God, who stretches out the heaven. So we can see that the Big Bang is in fact very, very biblical. And that takes us to our next slide. Three possible explanations for the universe. Three possible explanations for the universe. The universe always existed. <coughs> the universe always existed. And that, of course, has been vastly disproved by general relativity and Big Bang cosmology. The universe created itself. And as we learned in the first class, that is logically contradictory. If it created itself, it had to exist before it did the creating in order to do to create. So it would have to at least exist a second before it was created to do the creating, right? Because nothing did not become something. Finally, the universe was created by an outside agent, which we call God the only rational explanation. So there's only three explanations. You can choose which one you want to believe. The universe created itself, or that the universe is eternal, or that God did the creating. There's only three options there. Creation and Moses. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 1 because it is very, very powerful evidence for the creator God. It is very, very powerful evidence that in fact the Bible got this, you know, centuries, uh, uh, you know, 3,500 years well, way before we did. So how do we understand Genesis in light of the scientific evidence. And there's only two rules that we have to know, very simple, very understandable rules that we have to understand in order to properly interpret Genesis chapter 1. Because there are 12 creation accounts in Genesis chapter 1, and they're all in chronological order as we know them scientifically today, but you have to follow these two rules. And rule number one is, is words. There's two words used in Genesis chapter 1 to, um, to describe the creation account. The first one is bara. The first one is bara. And it is translated in the Strong's Concordance, the Strong Dictionary, created from nothing. Creation ex nihilo. That is, there was nothing, and then boom, it was, uh, there was something. And there's only three instances of this in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That word is translated created all three times. Okay, And, and we know that to be the universe. There was no word in the Hebrew uh, language that was universe. So when it talks of the universe, it uses the term the heavens and the earth. Okay, So we know Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, boom, God creates the heavens and the earth or the universe. Okay, That's creation ex nihilo from nothing. It's used the word bara there. Next, the sea creatures and everything that moves. That word is also used, bara. And finally, when it's creating, when God is creating man, uh, it uses the term bara as well, creation from nothing. So, uh, or creation ex nihilo, shall we say. 
So you have to understand that that word is a word that is used differently than the next word, which is asa. And asa, again, if you go into your Strong's, you will find that it is defined differently. It means to accomplish, to bring forth, to gather, to finish, to bring to pass, or to make visible. Okay, So that word's very different, and it's translated differently too. It doesn't use the word create, it uses the word made when it's being translated. So when you're reading through Genesis chapter 1, you see creation, that's creation from nothing. When you see the word made, it's either bring into existence or make visible, where we couldn't see it before. And so that's rule number two. And again, it's used in Genesis 1 verse 3, light becomes visible. Genesis 1 7, clouds and water cycle is made with everything that God had. It wasn't made from nothing. Um, Genesis chapter 1 verse 16, sun and moon become visible. Okay, again, many, many will say that word made means created, that at that point God creates the sun and the moon. It doesn't say that, okay, and it's not translated. It's translated that way. And so those are the two rules you need to know. There's two words flowing through there, and all we got to do is just interpret them properly. And then this. The, the next rule, remember I said there's two rules, right? Understanding the two words. And then rule number two is that after Genesis 1 verse 1, when it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, uh, moving forward, this perspective is earth. Okay, remember when we talked about interpreting uh, 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 Joshua, that the perspective was earth, and that's why the, 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 the sun stopped. Okay, well, in the, here in the same reason, we've got to interpret it properly. We've got to understand that going forward after Genesis 1-1, the perspective is earth. Once you get those two rules, this is what happens. It's absolutely beautiful because we see verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, matter and energy are created. That's when God creates the universe. Verse 2, the earth is without form. Verse 3, the sun is made. Again, that's the word made, so it's f being formed. Um, Number seven, water cycle and clouds are made. Number nine, the continents rise. And then we see in, in verse 10, the supercontinent, which scientists call Pangaea. We have uh, historical evidence to back that up. Uh, number 12, plants oxygenate the earth. Okay, the plants uh, are made on uh, in verse 12. And again, we need that in the right sequence because we need the plants to create the oxygen so that uh, we can breathe. Number verse 14, the atmosphere becomes transparent. And we know uh, the early earth had a very, very dense, um, uh, very dense atmosphere uh, like Mercury today. Well, here in this case, we begin to see that atmosphere now becoming transparent. In verse 15, the sun and the moon become visible when God says that there be light. Again, the perspective is earth. Um, verse 17, stars become visible. Verse 20, sea creatures are created. Uh, verse 21, reptiles and birds are created. Uh, verse 24, mammals are created. And finally, verse 27, man is created. And we see in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where man receives a spirit, making man unique to every other species on earth. Now, we have a specific creation account for man. So, remember I said you can be kind of be an evolutionist and be, you know, a, a, a Bible believer? Well, when it really comes down to man, though, that is going to be impossible because we know that man has a special creation event where God creates us from nothing. We did not in any way evolve from apes or anything else. So we've got that split there, which again, if in fact you claim to believe the Bible and evolution, you're going to have a real hard time reconciling those two. So that's how we make Genesis work. And... Um, it's a beautiful thing once you grasp this and you actually read through Genesis, you can actually see God creating the universe as we know today. So, we've got one more, we've got two more, but let's look at one more video here. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles. The very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. 
If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result, no stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these and many other numbers have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence to suggest that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be, it was designed that way. A 
A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. So that is a short video uh, from uh, William Lane Craig's ministry, Reasonable Faith. It's a very, very powerful witnessing tool. Again, some of these, some of these videos that are being pumped out now are very, very powerful because they say so much more than we could say here standing in a, uh, in a, in a church setting. So um, is the universe designed? Do we have a universe that is designed? I'm going to hit a few points now uh, that expresses fine-tuning. There are many, many more. Um, if this is a subject that you're interested in, in your um, uh, outlines there, your curriculum, you can actually see at the end of every uh, session, we have um, uh, references, books that you can get, videotapes, videos that you can watch that really, uh, um, you know, will serve to kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, edify you and uh, uh, give you more knowledge of this particular subject that we're on. This was one that really fascinated me, and uh, I've read quite a few, certainly all the books that are on that list, and, uh, and quite a few more because it is so fascinating. Tough stuff to retain. Again, what we're going to try to do here today is kind of simplify so we could use it in evangelism, but uh, overall it's just it's so vast, the uh, knowledge that we have of the universe and the evidence for fine-tuning. So uh, let's look at just a few points here. The protons that are positively charged uh, subatomic particles, which along with neutrons, form the nucleus of the atom around the negatively charged electro, uh, electron's orbit. Protons just happen to be eight, uh, uh, 1,836 times larger than electrons. If they were a little bigger or a little smaller, we would not exist because atoms could not form the molecules we require. So how did protons end up 1,836 times larger than electrons? Why not 100 times larger? Why not 100,000 times? Why not smaller? Uh, of all the possible uh, uh, variables, how did protons end up just the right size? Uh, here's another. Uh, protons carry a positive electrical charge uh, equal to that of the negative, negatively charged electrons. If protons did not balance electrons, you know, and vice versa, we would not exist. They are not comparable in size, yet they are perfectly balanced. Uh, did nature just stumble upon such an exact relationship, or did God uh, ordain it to be for our sake? So got a couple more. This is from a Walter Bradley who wrote Signs of Intelligence. A 2% increase in the strong force, that's the force that holds uh, protons in the, uh, in the atom, relative to, relative to the electromagnetic force, uh, which is the force between uh, charged particles, leaves the universe with no hydrogen and no water. So he's showing here that not only are these uh, forces fine-tuned, in this case the strong force and the electrical force, but their relationship has to be perfect as well. Uh, let's look at a couple more. If the electromagnetic force uh, relative to the gravitational force had been weaker, stars would contain a billion times less mass and would burn a million times faster. So again, he's comparing these two forces, gravity and electro. Uh, magnetism and saying, look, these are also, not only are they fine-tuned within their uh, respective field, but in addition to that, they're fine-tuned as they relate one force to another force. Hugh Ross, PhD, notes the ratio of electrons to proton mass, the velocity of light, the galaxy cluster density, the entropy level of the universe, the decay rate of protons, all had to be specifically tuned within an unthinkable window of possibility. Uh, he's an astronomer, an astrophysicist, and uh, has done incredible research in the topic of intelligent design. And he's saying, look, these relationships had to be incredibly, incredibly fine-tuned to make life possible. 
Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose, the Emperor's New Mind. Here's a quote from him, and I believe Roger Penrose is an atheist, and here's what he says. Knowing that the greater likelihood is that the universe would have collapsed into a great black hole, so it was more likely that the universe as it expanded would have ended up as a black hole, just recollapsing on itself. Oxford physicist Roger Penrose calculated just one of the parameters needed to set the universe on its course when he noted that the original phase space volume required an accuracy of 1 in 10 billion multiplied by itself 123 times. The number is so large it can't even be written out because it has more zeros than there are atoms in the universe. So this is a probability. In other words, when you talk about probabilities, you're saying, okay, uh, what's the probability of one in ten? You've got to put ten coins out in front of you. You got to pick the right one at the, you know, in on the first try. So he's saying it, the probability here is one in ten billion multiplied by itself 123 times. So you have to mark an atom, throw it out somewhere in the universe, and you have to pick it right on the first time. That's the probability of getting the uh, 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 the uh, phase space volume right the first time. Let's look at more probabilities here. Quote from the great Stephen Hawking, the mathematician estimated that if the rate of the universe expansion just one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed into a hot fireball. The odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like a Big Bang is enormous. And of course, he's an atheist who believes in the multiverse and uh, or who's putting out there that multiverse idea, which we'll talk about here in a, in a few. Fred Hoyle, the great astronomer from Cambridge, a common sense, and this was published in a, in a, in a, uh, a scientific journal in 1982, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Again, the great Frederick Hoyle has uh, stated clearly that some super intellect has monkeyed with physics. So, one more video. We have actually a short clip right before we end. And this one is called The Privileged Planet. It is also from Illustra. Uh, again, great witnessing tool. This one's specific about the Earth and how privileged it is and some of the factors necessary to make the Earth habitable for life. And again, this is from Illustra. If a recipe for a planet capable of supporting complex life really did exist, then what ingredients beyond liquid water might be required? The list of necessary factors continues to grow. We live on this paper-thin crust. If the Earth's crust were significantly thicker, then plate tectonic recycling could not take place. The Earth's crust varies in thickness from about 4 to 30 miles. It consists of more than a dozen tectonic plates that are in constant motion. This dynamic geology regulates the planet's interior temperature, recycles carbon, mixes chemical elements essential to living organisms, and shapes the continents. Deep within the Earth's interior, the movement of liquid iron generates a protective magnetic field essential to complex life. If our planet was smaller, its magnetic field would be weaker, allowing the solar wind to strip away our atmosphere, slowly transforming the Earth into a dead, barren world much like Mars. We need an oxygen atmosphere and the oxygen nitrogen um, atmosphere that the Earth has is necessary for complex life. As seen from space, the Earth's atmosphere glows as a thin blue ribbon of light. Measuring less than 1% of the planet's diameter, it is composed of a mixture of nitrogen, 
oxygen and carbon dioxide. As a result, our atmosphere ensures a temperate climate, protection from the sun's radiation, and the correct combination of gases necessary for liquid water and complex life. For a size of planet like Earth, our moon is big. The current thinking is that if our moon didn't exist, neither would we. One fourth the size of the Earth, the moon's powerful gravitational pull stabilizes the angle of its axis at a nearly constant 23 and a half degrees. This ensures relatively temperate seasonal changes and the only climate in the solar system mild enough to sustain complex living organisms. If we find life out there, especially complex or even intelligent life, it will be around a star similar to our own. We orbit what is known as a spectral type G2 dwarf main sequence star. It is well suited for our needs. If the sun were less massive, like 90% of the stars in the galaxy, the habitable zone would be smaller. To remain within its boundaries, the Earth would have to be positioned closer to its star. Here, increased gravity would lock our planet's rotation into synchronization with its orbit. While one side of the Earth continually faced the sun and increased radiation from solar flares, the dark side of the planet would lay shrouded in perpetual cold and ice. It is unlikely complex life could tolerate these drastic extremes in temperature. A lot of things went right on Earth to have uh, yielded complex life, absolutely. The number of factors that have been postulated um, has grown. Currently, the typical number you would see is in a typical list would have something like 20. We find that we need to be at the right location in the galaxy, that we're inside the circumstellar habitable zone of a star, that we're in a planetary system with giant planets that can shield the inner planets from too many comet impacts, that we're orbiting the right kind of star that's not too cool or not too hot, that we're on a planet that has a moon that can stabilize the tilt of its axis, that we're on a planet that's a terrestrial planet, a planet that has a crust that's just thick enough that it can maintain plate tectonic activity, but it has enough heat in its interior that it's still circulating its liquid iron core so it can generate a magnetic field, that it has an atmosphere that has enough oxygen to allow for complex organisms to survive, that it has enough water and enough continents to allow for the diversity of life or an active biosphere that you need to support complex creatures such as ourselves. All these factors have to be met at one place and time in the galaxy if you're going to have a planet as habitable as the Earth, which you need for complex and even technological life. In an attempt to estimate the probability of attaining this combination of factors simultaneously, some researchers have developed equations assigning a conservative 1 in 10 value to each factor deemed necessary for advanced life. If every element has to be there at the same time, you have to multiply the probabilities. And that's what makes the probability at the end so small. You've got 10% of this and 10% of that, and these things rapidly multiply to exceedingly small numbers. The number's on the order of 10 to minus 15, which is 1 1,000th one of 1 1 trillion. And it's a number like that that you have to compare to the 100 billion stars that are in the galaxy. 100 billion is a very large number, but a thousandth of a trillionth is much, much smaller. On their face value, these probabilities are speaking. What they're telling us is this can't happen, or this is very unlikely to happen in the galaxy. And that's where the evidence is pushing us. There are many probabilistic resources in the galaxy, but on the other side of the coin are all these factors that you need. You have to get just right in order to have just one habitable planet like the Earth. And that leads me to conclude that yes, we're rare in the galaxy. So once again, that's Illustra Media talking about the fine tuning of our solar system. So let's take a few minutes to look at a few more examples of how our solar system is in fact fine tuned. 
the earth has vapor liquid and frozen water which biochemists now believe are essential for life to exist a five percent change in the distance from the sun would rid the planet of life our planet is a plant this one's awesome our planet must retain water vapor while allowing the slightly lighter dangerous gases to uh, such as methane and ammonia to escape therefore a change in the surface gravity of just four percent would make this impossible so we see that our atmosphere is very very fine-tuned the earth's rotation was just slightly faster hurricanes and tornado tornadoes would extinguish life slightly slower and temperature variations would be too great that sun would just beat down too hard for too long the planets that orbit the sun uh, with us are also essential for example university of chicago physicist george Wethrill discovered that if jupiter was not located precisely where it is providing a gravitational shield for earth we would be bombarded with 1000 times more comets so even Jupiter is essential. We saw how the moon was very essential in stabilizing our orbit. Here's a couple more. Uh, unlike every other substance known to man, water's solid form, that is ice, is less dense than its liquid form. This causes ice to float. If ice did not float, our planet would experience runaway freezing. Other important properties of water include its solvency, cohesiveness, adhesiveness, and thermal properties. A couple more. The Earth's reflectivity, or its albedo, the total amount of light reflected off the planet versus the total amount of light absorbed, were greater than it is now, we would experience runaway freezing. If it were less than it is now, we would experience runaway greenhouse gases. So the reflectability of the Earth is essential. Our magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, which we don't understand fully yet, but we do know there's a magnetic field protecting us from um, cosmic radiation. The Earth's magnetic field were weaker, our planet would be devastated by cosmic radiation. If it were much stronger, we would be devastated by severe, severe electromagnetic storms. So that magnetic field, again, essential for life. We don't quite understand it yet. We know it has to do with the core of our of Earth, but we don't quite understand it. We just do know it's there. The sun would shoot so much radiation at, at us here that it would extinguish life. The Earth's place in the solar system were further from the sun, our planet's water would freeze. If it were 5% closer, it would boil. So our distance from the sun, again, very, very fine tune. If our solar system were too close to the center of our galaxy or too or to any of the spiral arms at the edge or any cluster of stars, our planet would be devastated by cosmic radiation. If the sun were much redder on the one hand or bluer on the other, photosynthesis would be impended. Photosynthesis is a natural biochemical process crucial to life on Earth. Now, this is important. Back in 1963, we knew of only three parameters needed to maintain life on Earth. In 1989, astrophysicist Hugh Ross, which we quoted earlier, published the first edition of Fingerprint of God and listed 16 characteristics required, requiring fine-tuning for the universe and 19 for the solar system. By 1995, when he published The Creator and the Cosmos, the list was 26, uh, again, improbable, fine-tuned features of the universe and 41 for the solar system. Today, his list, which you can find on his website, reasons.org, you will find no less than 35 vastly improbable characteristics necessary to make life possible in the universe and 122 for the solar system. And every one of these is evidence for God. Okay, I mean, if there was just one, again, you could say that someone fine-tuned this and therefore there must be a designer. And now we have 35 for the universe and 122 for the solar system. Now look, as Christians, we should be using this stuff. You know, the fact that in the early uh, 20th century, Christianity and the scientific community broke off because of some reasons that we don't want to talk about now. Maybe we'll talk about when we get to session number 10. But, it, you know, we broke off from science. We took the wrong position. The scientific community kept going without us. Initially, it was Christianity that was driving the science. 
And then again, in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, we both went our separate ways. And again, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about it in session 11, why this happened, but why we should be reclaiming the sciences and using these incredible evidence as witnessing tools. So, the genetic code, the genetic code is God's language. The genetic code is God's language. All life forms begin with cells that contain proteins, amino acids, molecules, and ultimately the DNA that holds the information which determines the many functions within that cell. In complex life, it determines our hair color, our height, our fingernails, uh, ligaments, their taste buds, all the intricacies of our eyes from the color to the lens of the cornea, to the retina, to the smallest molecule are driven by our DNA genetic code. And it all applies to bees, alligators, birds, fish, and single cell bacteria. That is that there's this genetic code, these sequences of four letters that determine how, what amino acids will be, will be made and ultimately what proteins will form. So think about that. It's like an instruction manual. But you don't just have random letters. You have very specialized letters to do certain, to create certain amino acids that do certain functions. Now, someone had to write the code to decipher what those codes would be. In other words, when you have these many letters, you will get this cell, which will ultimately unite to make an, you know, uh, an eye or a fingernail or what have you. Some, there's gotta be a code writer that said, these cells will create these amino acids. And when these amino acids combine, they will make this protein and this protein will have this function. Next, when you have this string of, of genetic information, of DNA, then it will make these amino acids. And that string of thousands of whatever, thousands of thousands of, of amino acids will then combine. Uh, they actually fold on themselves to create a specific protein with a specific function. Okay. Someone had to write that code that, it, that deciphers all this information to create the right amino acids and ultimately the right proteins. And here's just a, a visual of the genetic code. We can see there the double helix, which we all saw in science class. This is where that, that DNA strands work. Chromosomes are like... Assume you have a library that these are like the different wings of the library. They're all mass amount of information in these chromosomes. Humans have 46 wings, so to speak, of that library information. A gene is a set of code which ultimately makes a set of functioning amino acids, which will ultimately turn into one protein with one function. So a gene is kind of a string of information that ultimately results in a string of amino acids, which ultimately has one protein behind it. So we go from the genome, which is all the genetic information, to the chromosome, which are different, you know, where it's broken up into different libraries or different sections. Um, then as we get smaller, we go to the gene, which the gene is again, a string of information, uh, uh, which ultimately turns into an amino acid, which at the end turns into that functioning protein, which builds uh, life systems. Single cell life, the origins of life. Now, as we mentioned before, the mystery of the origins of how this first single cell life began has not been solved. And remember what we said, we're not going to argue from the God of the gaps. We're going to argue from information, from precision, uh, 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 from design. Okay. So why hasn't the origin of life mystery been solved. And the reason is very simple, because the simplest cell acts like a, like a city, like New York City. It's so vastly complex. How complex is it? Well, um, Paul Taylor talks about it in uh, Origin's answer book, and he shows us, he gives us a formula, you know, how we can decipher how improbable it is for life to begin by natural process. That is the singlest, simplest cell in E. coli bacteria. He says, two well-known scientists calculated the odds of life forming by natural processes. They estimated that there is less than one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. That's one chance with a 10 and 40,000 zeros after it. 
that life could have originated by random trials. Now, these aren't random numbers. They actually went through all the, the, the sequences that you need, all the uh, amino acids you need, the different proteins, how they function within a cell, and, once, and they just started looking at probabilities and multiplying those numbers by themselves. So 10 to the 40,000th is a, is a one with 40,000 zeros. How can one gain conception of the size of such a huge number? According to evolutionists, the universe is less than 30 billion years old. There are fewer than 10 to the 18th seconds in 30 billion years. So try to imagine the size of this number. Seconds. There's only 10 to the 18th uh, um, uh, seconds within the whole history of 30 billion years. So even if nature could somehow have produced trillions of genetic code combinations uh, every second for 30 billion years, the probability against producing the simplest one cell animal by trial and error would still be inconceivably immense. So remember we were talking about chance. That chance doesn't explain something. Chance says it fell within a statistical probability, a statistical distribution. So we can say chance did it. When you have these odds, you can no longer say that chance did it. Because that would be like me rolling a thousand sixes and saying, oh, it's just chance. Well, no one would, would take you seriously, right? If you win the lottery every day or every week for you know the next 30 years and someone said, how did it happen? You say, oh, chance did it. They'd say, no, that does not explain it. So in the same way, the origins of life, the origins of an eye, the origins of a kidney, the origins of a fruit tree, all fall way outside of the ability of chance to explain it. Nobel Prize laureate, chemist, Linus Pauling, here's a quote from him, just one living cell in the human body is more complex than the city of New York. So the genetic code, matters of information. So it's not just <laughs> that these sequences are improbable, the more, the more unlikely and the more astonishing part is that it reveals information. So try to imagine a military plane flying over the ocean and it spots an island down below. And when they look down, they see that a bunch of palm trees were laid out and it spelled the word help, right? There's information latent in that. Nobody would stop and say, oh, those trees probably just fell over and landed in that position, right? Because any time we have information, we know that there is an information provider, that there has to be a designer, a mind behind the information. Well, when you think of something so simple, I mean, you're, again, if you're in that plane and you're flying over and you see that on the island, you're not going to just brush it off and say, hey, that was just probably chance, even something that simple much less something as complex as a genetic code, can we simply step back and say, chance did it? Because an atheist wouldn't do it. And remember when we were talking about worldviews, the inability of an atheist to, to, to be consistent with his worldview. If he sees help, he says, there's someone down there that needs help. But when he looks at the genetic code, he, he wants us to believe that that happened simply by chance. And that is a big stretch. Matters of information, here's a quote from a former atheist, Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew was the Richard Dawkins of the 1990s. In other words, he was an atheist, he was publishing books against God, against theism, and he finally got to a place where he said, this is unlikely the product of chance, and what really convinced him was the information in DNA. He wrote a book, there is a God, how the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. And here's a quote from that book. Yes, I know, I now think it does point to a creative intelligence almost entirely because of the DNA investigation. What I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together, I now believe there is a God. Now, he didn't become a Christian and start going to church and singing hallelujah, but he did become a deist. I'm not sure. He's now dead. He died a few years ago. But uh, I do know that, in fact, he rejected atheism because of the information in the DNA. So here's another quote from John Lennox, PhD from Oxford. 
Like a computer hard disk, DNA contains the database of information and the program to produce a, speci a specified product. Every one of the 10 to 100 tr trillion cells in the human body contains a database larger than the Encyclopedia Britannica, a molecule structure with an information processing capacity. Charles Thaxton, a PhD, also notes the DNA code is the genetic language that communicates information to the cell. The cell is very complicated using millions of DNA instructions to control every function within that cell. Now, the atheists knew they have a problem, had a problem, and so they came up with a new theory, and it is called panspermia. This is, and let me just read from the slide, this is the most popular theory to explain how life emerged on Earth. That is, that it got here from another planet, transferred by a comet or other intelligent life. Of course, this is not scientific and does not solve the problem of how life emerged from naturalistic causes. The theory just pushes the date back. That's all it says is that, hey, we're just going to push this thing back so we don't have to deal with it. A pants for me, a, a definitely a weak theory. Let's look at one more slide. Inform oh, we talked about information theory, and that is this idea that information never advances. That in a closed system, a natural system that is closed without an intelligent intervention, that information will always diminish. And we use the example of our garage. We close our garage door, we leave, come back 10 years later, and obviously we lost information. Colors faded, bugs ate things. And, it, and you know, if you just think of the history of, of archaeology, you know, as you're looking for dinosaurs, the further back you go, bones, stuff, we lose information over time. And in fact, but yet for biological system to evolve, you would need a vast, vast um, uh, increase in information very regularly in order to accomplish what uh, we have in the diversity of species. Okay, this is the last video. It is a very short clip, and then we are going to wrap this session up. In the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, no. no, no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but I'm, that I'm... higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design just certain types of designers such as God so that okay so that was Richard Dawkins admitting that it's possible of intelligent design he's just saying don't call him God as long as you don't call him God you can say that intelligent design exists now I love Richard Dawkins because if you're an evangelist you know before Richard Dawkins you would say things like well uh, Christians invented the scientific process and they would say, no, they didn't, and then they would come up with all these ideas. Now today, um, all you got to say is, Richard Dawkins says so, 
and boom, the argument's over. They'll, they'll concede their point because Richard Dawkins, the high priest of atheism, has, has uh, conceded the point, and he's obviously a guy who's looking every way out. So um, for me, it has actually been a, a benefit because, again, prior to that, you'd make a claim, uh, Christians invented science, and they would argue, no, they didn't. It came from the, um, uh, you know, it's a product of the Enlightenment, and, and they weren't Christians. It, not anymore. Now with Richard Dawkins, you say, Richard Dawkins says so, boom, and that's what it is. So kind of uh, interesting how we could uh, use that in our favor. So let's look at, because to everything that we said today, if you go on YouTube, you're going to find lots and lots of objections to what we said. But we're going to summarize them all in these objections right here. Um, and it's kind of important that you know them, and we're going to kind of tell you how, how they work. They're empty, they're baseless. But nevertheless, they are, they are producing far more videos uh, to the objections of intelligent design and God than we Christians are producing on intelligent design and the evidence for God. So we want to know what these say, because as soon as you tell someone intelligent design, they go on the Internet, they come back and say, wait a minute, intelligent design, it's not science, it's all made up. Okay, so let's look at some of the objections that they're using. First objection, we are... Only one of many possibilities. We are one of only many possibilities. In other words, yes, we're human. Yes, we're genetically fit, but we could have been something else. We could have had a horn in the, in the middle of our head. We could have been bacteria. And so there's no reason to think that we're anything special. Now, the problem with that, like the multiverse, which we're going to look at next, is that it doesn't deal with what you have. Let, let me give you an example. If I walked into my house one day, and there's a cow in the middle of the living room, right? I don't just walk past that cow and head to the bathroom, right? I got to stop and say, why is there a cow in my living room? I don't say, hey, wait a minute. It could have been a cat. It could have been a dog. It could have been a bug. Eh, why ask? Let me just go to the bathroom and we'll forget about the cow. Of course not. We stop and we say, why is this cow in my living room, which I would do right after the barbecue. Why is this cow in my living room, right? There's a cow in my living room. We got to deal with what we have, okay? So what they're trying to do when they say we are a product of many possibilities, or in the case of the multiverse, which says there are many, many universes, we're just one of them. Uh, number one, it's not scientific. And number two, it denies an explanation for what we have, right? It's not scientific in nature. We want to understand what is here and why we're here. So it is not a legitimate um, uh, refutation, uh, refuting uh, intelligent design in any way, shape, or form, okay? It's simply them saying, why are you asking? Don't bother asking, okay? Because we're simply one of many possibilities. It's not how we deal with things in science, in forensic. You know, when we walk into a, a crime scene, we don't say, well, you know, they died, but, you know, they could have died many other ways, so why investigate? Of course not. We want to know exactly what happened and why it happened the way it did, okay? So, once again, this is one that's very popular. We are one of many possibilities. There's tons of videos out there that try to discredit intelligent design on these terms. And then, of course, the multiverse, which is a, um, uh, you know, it's backed by uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's, is this idea that there, there were many universes, there are many universes, and we are one of many. And so why think that we're special? Why think that we're fine-tuned? If you have enough universes, eventually this one's going to pop out. Uh, again, it denies this uh, idea of investigating and understanding truth claims um, by simply saying there are so many of them. There's no science behind the multiverse. It is all fictional. It is all imaginary. There's no evidence. And many uh, astrologers actually say, um, astronomers actually say that you can't even test it even if you wanted to. So uh, that's the multiverse. Let's look at a couple more. If the universe needs an explanation, then the designer needs an explanation, right? I uh, saw this one uh, very, very recently, very, very many, lots of hits on this one. Uh, and this is a flawed assumption, okay? We walk into a cave and we look at cave drawings. We don't simply say, well, we can't determine whether this is an intelligent designer until we find out who did this and what and what their nature is. Of course we don't say that. We recognize intelligent design when we see those cave drawings. So, and then of course that would send you into an infinite regress. Well, if we got to know who designed this, then we got to know who designed that designer, and then we've got to know who designed uh, that, you know, uh, you know, we got to know about them, and it sends you into an infinite regress. 
right? So it's not legitimate. We don't need to know who the creator is, the designer is, in order to make a claim that something was designed. Okay, and that's what they're trying to get at. You cannot claim a, a, a intelligent designer unless you can show who that intelligent designer is. Nonsense, nonsense. When you look at cave drawings, that was designed. Uh, and we don't need to know much about that designer to make that claim, okay? The universe is not friendly to life. Rather, it wants to kill us. And this was one of the first ones that uh, uh, Neil Tyson deGrasse did on a video that I watched uh, a couple months ago, you know, oh, that we're special, we're supposed to be special, but in fact, that's not true because the universe is trying to kill us. It is unfriendly to us. It is trying to destroy us. How could a God make that? Well, that's a real problem with that claim. I live on Earth where there's oxygen, where there's water, where there's fruits, where there's vegetables that I could eat. So while the universe might be that way, I don't live in a black hole or, you know, in a, um, you know, cosmic radiation uh, zone uh, I live here on Earth, and here on Earth it is very habitable, and it does not want to kill me. Yes, we have tsunamis, and yes, we have uh, other natural forces, but as a general rule, most of us live on an Earth that is peaceful, that is inhabitable, and so I don't understand this claim, but it's, it was, it's his biggest one, and he's used it many, many times when he's trying to discredit uh, creation or intelligent design. The laws of physics created the universe. Now, again, if you look at naturalists who claim it's the laws of physics that created the universe, the problem with that is laws don't create anything, right? The laws of mathematics do not create a million dollars in my bank account, right? I've got to physically deposit that money in the bank account. Laws do not create. And of course, they presume the laws uh, uh, as the universe is, is, is expanding and the earth is forming, but nevertheless, Laws don't create themselves, and laws themselves don't create anything. So they'll go to the law argument, um, and again, the problem is that laws operate on things. They don't um, create anything. ID is arguing from the gaps. Again, another big one. Intelligent design, these guys are arguing from the God of, a God of the gaps, and you can see that we're not. We're taking the scientific information, and we are best interpreting it just as Darwin does, okay? And many of them will say that it is not scientific. And that's the last one we're gonna look at. That intelligent design is not science. Well, it isn't science. Theory, just like Darwinian evolution is. It uses the same um, scientific method that Darwin uses, which is inference to the best explanation, okay? Darwin isn't science. Darwin is a theory, and it uses the method of inference of the best explanation, and that's exactly what we're doing in intelligent design. But we, we're actually stepping it up a notch because we're applying mathematics. And if you look at some of David Berlinski's arguments against evolution, uh, we, we uh, quoted from him last, last uh, week, one of the smartest men in the world, right? Philosopher, uh, um, uh, mathematician, and uh, uh, a biologist. He uh, states very clearly that how can you... How is, a, how is a theory credible when you don't apply mathematics? Mathematics is the queen of the sciences. It is the most empirical of them all. And so any good theory uses mathematics to make its case, as we have throughout physics and astronomy and what have you. But in, in, in evolution, they reject mathematics. And why would they? Of course, because once you apply mathematics, like we're doing in intelligent design, um, then mathematics will show you that, in fact, uh, random mutations could not account for the diversity of life. So if anything, it is more scientific than the theory of evolution, not less scientific. So finally, questions for the skeptics, questions for the skeptic. Now you're evangelizing and uh, you, know, you come across someone who says, I'm an atheist. And so let's throw some questions at that atheist. How did life begin? That's a good one. Because again, it is mysterious. As you saw, even Richard Dawkins himself has said, there's no credible uh, theory that could explain life because it is so complex. Where did gravity and the other laws of nature come from? Because again, a naturalist will already presume these laws are in effect. And these are forces. They're not just laws. They're physical forces. And so where did they come from? You know, how did they get here? Uh, one theist defined God as that of the laws of nature. That is to say, they're powerful. They are precise. Uh, they are creative. 
uh, in nature or as they form things. So if you define the laws of nature, then you're ultimately defining God. Now, I think God is much greater than the laws of nature, but nevertheless, they certainly have the characteristics of God himself. Uh, why do chemicals bind? You know, why are these molecules acting the way they do? We just don't know. We know they act. Science tells us this is how they act. They don't tell us why they act the way they do. Is it coincidence that we are in the right distance from the sun, have the right mass, the right atmosphere, the right chemical elements, and the right location in our galaxy? Is this a coincidence? And here's the thing. They'll say, well, there's so many, um, uh, so many galaxies... Uh, so many solar systems that we're just a product of one. But if you actually go to the reasons.org, they add probabilities to all the different aspects of life and what is required. And they'll show there still isn't even enough galaxies to create a solar system like ours. The eye has many parts, including 1.2 million sensors, perfectly arranged. How do you account for an eye by chance alone? Next one, we, we know who wrote the Microsoft code, who wrote the DNA code, which is infinitely more complex. So who wrote this DNA code is a good question for an atheist. How do we explain the precision we see in the laws of physics, which we saw a video from um, William Lane Craig's ministry uh, on that subject, how precise these laws have to be. How did the universe begin? We know the cosmological argument from last week and the, the first week. Uh, how did the universe begin? You know, how did it start? Why is there something rather than nothing? Because philosophically speaking, if there is no God, it is far more likely that there would be nothing, not what we see today. Uh, every cell in your body contains a library of information. How does chance account for a library? And remember, this is specified information. If we change some of these DNA strands or some of these uh, uh, DNA sequences, we have no vision. So it falls within a very small uh, uh, a window of possibilities, specified information. How does a brown cat eat green grass and produce white milk? I mean, for s someone who's simple, I've used this one before, and again, it stumps them. And especially for the agnostic who says, well, God didn't give us enough evidence to make a decision. Okay, well, then you should be able to answer this question very simply. How does a brown cow eat green grass and produce white milk? Simple question. You should be able to answer it if God didn't give us enough evidence. And, of course, they cannot. And that will wrap up today's session. And we hope you got something out of it. Next week, it starts getting very, very exciting. And uh, we hope you'll be back. And uh, any questions now, let's take a quick break and then we'll go right to questions. Thank you.